Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. If you get a chance, please tell your friends about the channel, Dan Heisman Chess. We think we've got some quality stuff here. Today we're going to talk about Guide to Ponder Rook 3, which is really guide to playing in algebraic notation h2 to h3, h7 to h6, a2 to a3, or a7 to a6, but uh, it's a lot easier to use descriptive in this case and say guide to ponder rook three. Whoops, that's not a three, that's a four. Okay, so yeah, those moves. All right, so I picked the position here, and I there's a whole bunch of principles that you can use, and there's no one answer in every position. There's some positions where playing a ponder rook three is a complete waste of time. It could even be worse than a waste of time. It could create a target for your opponent. It could be a negative move. There's times when it's absolutely positively necessary, and if you don't do it, you've got a big problem. And then there's times where it's kind of like, yeah, you could play this, you could play that. If you play it, it's not too bad. So it, there's no one answer where it's always terrible or it's always great or always avoid it or, or, or you should always play it. It doesn't work that way. So we're going to give some examples of good and bad here, and hopefully you'll start to get the idea. Let's start with an example where h3 is reasonable. It's white's move here, and normally you want to develop your pieces. You want to get all your pieces out, move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic, stuff like that. But here's a principle that you could look at, and that is if your opponent has a piece that only has one good square and you could take that square away from him when he's developing, then it's not unreasonable to do that. So here, let's look at all the bishop moves from the bishop on c8. Bishop, let's, let's say white plays his best move, bishop d3. Well, bishop h3 is no good where he loses the bishop. Bishop g4 is a nice little pin, and if white's going to castle king side, that could be okay. Bishop f5 is terrible. We'll just take it with a pawn. Bishop e6 is terrible. We'll just fork the knight and the bishop. And bishop d7 blocks in the queen, blocks in the knight's retreat if he wants to play this break move. It's really kind of a poor place to put a bishop. So there's really only one good place to put the bishop. If your opponent only has one good place to put the bishop, then playing h3 might be reasonable. And here you can see I ran stockfish 15 here. Stockfish 15 says h3 is the second best move at 22-23 ply. It's about a quarter pawn not as good as just developing the bishop. So in this position, it was when I ran the engine. And so playing h3 here is not unreasonable because it takes away the only good square for the bishop. Now let's say that e6 was a good square for the bishop. If e6 was a good square, let's say the knight wasn't here and there was no fork and maybe d5 doesn't even do anything. Let's say, oh, I don't know. Let's go back and play Philidors instead and set up a similar position. Maybe uh, d3, c6. Now bishop e6 is perfectly reasonable move. Yes, it doubles the pawns, but it gets another pawn in the middle and gives black a semi-open file. So black has other things he can do with that bishop later. So now playing h3 is going to be a lot more of a problem. Let's see if Stockfish, let's show the top three moves and see if h3 makes it in. Okay, so here, two of the top three moves are actually to move the a pawn so that Black can't try to trap the bishop. Now, he can't trap the bishop right away. If you play h3 and black plays b5 and he plays bishop b3 and he plays a5, you can always move the a pawn now. In fact, you'd have to to prevent it from being trapped. Let's say a4 is the best move here. But you didn't have to do that on the previous move. But here, playing h3 is, does not make the top three because if you play h3, black will eventually just develop the bishop here, or maybe push the pawns and develop the bishop that way. So it doesn't make sense to stop that pin here. That pin's not such a big deal. For instance, even castles is a better move than h3, and a lot of people are like, oh no, if I castle, he'll pin the knight then. And now you can see that h3 is close to the number one move. The top two moves are to 
stop him from advancing on the queen side with a4 or to play h3 and this is a good example of h3 this is called putting the question to the bishop so when the bishop pins the knight you ask the bishop right away where do you want to go tell me what you want to do because if he goes here he can no longer influence the center as easily and get back in the game in fact stockfish here says you should actually play g4 which a lot of lower rated players are afraid to play because they're afraid they're going to open up their king and get checkmated but actually they're making this bishop pretty bad but that's the subject for a different video but the point is after h3 bishop h5 the white has gained a little bit he's gained love for his king for the middle game he's taken that bishop away from going back toward the middle if the bishop takes the knight he gets out of the pin and he wins the bishop pair if the bishop goes back this way then as i said he sort of got a free move in here so this is a good example of a principle which is you don't necessarily play h3 to stop a pin necessarily being the key word sometimes you do sometimes you don't but if he does pin you then playing h3 becomes a much much more reasonable move so you can see here stockfish is completely agreeing with it in this position in this position he definitely does not want well let's let's make black's move let's say black plays um let's let's do before the castle in this position with black's move uh white's move white cannot play h3 to any great effect because even though it stops the pin that bishop has other good places to go once he allows the pin let's allow the pin a different way this way let's say now h3 is clearly by far the number one move and you're saying put the question to the bishop mr bishop where do you want to go it, hopefully you can see the difference there the difference is that wasting a tempo to stop him from cat whoops wrong move wasting a tempo to stop him from castling when he has other good places to put the bishop is a big waste of time so you don't want to do that all right let's go to an opening that he's, i see a lot of people get burned with sometime let's say you're a beginner and you're playing black and uh let me make this a little bit bigger and normally after e4 e5 knight f3 black plays knight c6 or he plays the petrov defense knight f6 but a lot of beginners play the philidor defense d6 and against the philidor defense the main move for white is to play d4 and put pressure on the on the e-pawn threatening to take it and making black do something either give up the center a little bit with pawn takes or get more of a passive defense with maybe the main line knight d7 okay but a lot of people here for white play the second best move which is bishop c4 and now a lot of beginners who are black play knight f6 and then white says oh i can play knight g5 which is of course not the fried liver attack the fried liver attack is sacrificing your knight for the f7 pawn in the two knights defense and this is not even a two knights defense so this is just an attack on f7 with knight g5 as i said a lot of people try to generalize what a fried liver attack is but this is not it okay and now black's only good way to save f7 is to move his d pawn again and play up to d5 and now he's reached a position from the two knights defense where he's down a tempo because he doesn't have a knight on c6 so let's let's show that the two knights defense is e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop c4 knight f6 and now knight g5 notice the pawn's not on d6 and now the main move is to play d5 white should take and now believe it or not black should not take back that's the famous um inaccuracy the main move here which equalizes and is the reason why grandmasters don't play this for white is knight a5 knight takes d5 being a mistake and now white can play the lolly d4 or more commonly he plays the fried liver attack knight takes f7 so this is similar to what we looked at but not the same what we just looked at was the philidor defense where the pawn goes to d6 which never happens in that other line bishop c4 and now they get burned on knight f6 knight g5 and they don't even realize they should play d5 and then they do something silly they either play bishop here and they lose a pawn or they play queen here and then they don't realize by counting this doesn't work i can still take here and hit the rook and he can't take me anyway so it's not really a guard to play queen there anyway and they get all frustrated and say oh i can't do that so the next time they get to this position they say i want to bring my knight out but i can't because they'll play knight g5 so they play this move h6 i've seen this move many 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 times in this position it's a real beginner move it's a terrible move 
Well, does it avoid the line they just fell into? Yes. But is that the right way to do that? No. If you want to stop knight to g5 here, there's a much, 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 much better way to do it than to waste a tempo by playing. By the way, if someone does play h6 and waste the tempo, when people are wasting time like that, you want to break open the game. So you want to play d4. But what's the better way to play than h6 if h6 isn't the right idea? The answer is, well, it's simple. You're already blocked in your bishop, so he's not going anywhere. So rather than playing h6 to stop knight g5, you play bishop e7 first. And now you might say, but Dan, that doesn't work. If white plays a move like castles and then knight to f6, he still can play knight g5 because you've blocked the bishop and the queen. And my answer is, well, yes, that's true. But now if you play knight g5, the bishop's already out, which means you could guard this pawn a second time by simply castling. And now this move knight g5 looks very, very bad because it's not doing anything. This attack on f7 doesn't work. Let's say you think Reinfeld values are perfect and you think, oh, knights and bishops are worth rooks and pawns. Let's expose this king with knight takes, rook takes, bishop takes, pawn takes. And you go, okay, I gave up six for six, but his king is coming out toward the middle. That's good for me. Mr. Stockfish, is that true? What's the evaluation of this position? Stockfish says, oh, White could almost resign here. If you don't understand why, it's a good idea to go over the values of the pieces and realize the, the, the Reinfeld values are not very accurate. And here, the player early in the game that gets two pieces for a rook and a pawn is almost always winning the game. And here, it's no exception. The bishop and the knight were worth way, way, way more than the rook and the pawn. And also, black's ahead in development here. All of white's pieces are still on the back rank. And this position is already winning for black. We need about a minus one to be winning. And Stockfish says it's minus 2.75. So white can't do that. If we go back to the position before he blundered and took on f7, Stockfish says if he doesn't do that, and he just admits, all right, I'm going to have to bring the knight back, and he plays d3, then black's advantage is only about 0.4 pawns. Stockfish says here black's best move is c6, and it says white's best two moves are bring the knight back, or you could even play h3 now, which, again, kind of prevents the bishop from going there. Now, there's another idea of preventing things from going to g4, and that's not the bishop, it's the knight. So let's look at that next. Um, let's go to like a dragon. Let's make the board bigger again. Um, so when you get positions where you want your bishop on e3 for white, knight f6, knight c3, g6, if you want your bishop on e3, you don't want the knight harassing it because he'd be threatening to win the bishop pair. And also the knight, the bishop only really has one good square here. So you can play bishop e3, and black can't play knight g4 because of bishop checks. And now if the bishop goes in the way, it's a sneaky pin. You just take off the knight. So he can't do it right away. So he's going to wait. And now the main move for white is to stop the knight from going here, not the bishop. And the main move for white is f3, which stops the knight from going there and guards the pawn. But it has the same kind of function as f3, except it does everything that f3 does and even a little more. It gives the bishop a little scope. It helps the pawns come up to h g4 and h4 when white castles queen side. But the point here is, if you play a move like h3 or f3, the idea isn't to prevent the bishop from coming to g4. Bishop to g4 would, would not be a harmful thing here. It's the knight to g4 that forces the bishop to go away from guarding this important central square. See, what black's going to do here is, let's say white, you know, does play f3, the main move. Black can play a move like knight c6, and now he's got multiple pieces hitting the square. And that's why you need to protect this bishop on e3. It's really the only good square for the bishop right here in the opening. So you can't allow the knight to chase him around. There's a line in the Nadorf where you do allow him to chase him around. If we go back and we play in Nadorf instead, and white plays bishop e3 right away, there's a line that goes knight to g4, and now you don't, can't let him take the bishop. It would be a beginner move to play queen here and give him the bishop pair so soon. 
Now when you fee encoder this bishop, it's going to be a monster on the dark squares because it's unopposed. So the line goes bishop g5, h6. Why, why h6? Here's an example where black can play h6 because he's attacking a piece that's worth more and he gets like a free move. So that's different than when you play h6 and there's nothing on g5. Bishop here, pawn here, bishop here, bishop fianchettos. And now h3 becomes a reasonable move, right? To drive the knight away. Let's ask Stockfish where h3 would be in this situation. Stockfish says h3 is fighting for number one. Right now it's number two. Now it's back to number one. So, so again, h3, very reasonable. Why is it reasonable? Because there's a piece on g4, and it's on your side of the board, and you could kind of get a free move. And that would also give the bishop a place to go later in the game if the bishop needs to tuck himself away. So h3, reasonable there. What's, what's the whole point here? The point is that there's a lot of positions that look something like this, where you want a bishop on e3, and you need to stop knight g4. In the dragon, you do it with f3, but there's other openings where you might do it with h3. And here, h3 is not to prevent any kind of bishop pin. It's not to prevent the bishop from developing a g4. You're really not worried about that. It's to stop the knight from going there. So you want to recognize positions like that. All right, so let's take a look at the closed Roy Lopez. Turn off the engine, make the board bigger again. All right, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. If white plays a move like, I don't know, let's say he plays the Ponziani, c3, not threatening anything, it would be ridiculous for black to play a6 to say, oh, now I'm going to prevent the Roy Lopez. I would bet a6 is not in the top five here. Well, so far I'm wrong. a6 is hanging in there around fourth or fifth. As I said, it's not a ridiculous move, but it's certainly not the move I would play. I'm surprised it's in the top five, but Stockfish does that sometimes to me. It makes me a little bit of a liar, but that's okay. Uh, all right, so right now, I should have said he's not in the top four. All right, well, as I've been talking, he fell out of the top five. Thank goodness. All right, so Stockfish says, no, Dan, you're, it's close, but we'll, right now we'll give you a reprieve, and A6 is not in the top five. Okay, so let's go back and... A6 just doesn't make any sense in a position like this. But if white plays the Roy Lopez, then A6, which I believe is called Morphe's move, is a very reasonable move. Why is it? Well, the point is that white is going to be threatening a removal of the guard of this pawn, but the removal of the guard doesn't work right away. If you play A6 and he takes and you take back and knight, the knight tries to take the pawn, then black will get the pawn back favorably with queen to d4, double attacking the pawn and the knight. So the idea of playing a6 in the Roy Lopez is get the bishop back to a4 right away so that later if he does threaten to take the knight, you can just play b5. For instance, suppose you don't do that. Suppose we play the main line of the closed defense without the moves a6, bishop a4. Suppose we play knight f6, castle, and now the main line, of course, is the Berlin Wall knight takes e4. But let's say black plays bishop e7 and white plays here. Now, because this pawn is guarded, white is threatening bishop takes knight followed by knight takes pawn, which means a6 is a terrible move. And white says, oh, thank you. You're forcing me to win a pawn. Bishop takes, pawn takes, knight takes. And now queen here doesn't work anymore. We'll just attack the queen. And he, queen can't take the pawn. And if he pins my queen, that's a counting error. Why is it a counting error? Because let's count. I get a queen. You get a queen. I get a bishop. I'm ahead of bishop. Okay. A lot of people here go, oh, I can't take the queen. My knight's pinned. Well, that's silly. You get a queen. He gets a queen. You get a bishop. You win a knight. So he can't do that. Black can't pin that knight. He's got to move the queen back. And when he moves the queen back somewhere, wherever he goes, we don't care. He can go all the way back to d8. He hasn't won this pawn, and white's just up a pawn. So the main line in the Roy Lopez is to play that knight, that that pawn to a6 when you still have a chance, while he's not winning the the pawn. So after bishop a4, knight f6, castle, bishop e7. Now when you guard the pawn and you threaten to play bishop takes knight, black has a very easy defense. 
he just plays b5 because he's already got an a6 in when it was safe and now he can play b5 to preserve the knight here to guard the pawn and after bishop b3 these days black usually castles and now white could play c3 and black could play either the closed Roy Lopez or he could play the martial attack martial attacks considered to be fairly equal these days with computer analysis um, or white could play an anti-martial like a4 or d3 or h3 or something like that let's say on the other hand that white plays c3 and black says i didn't want to play the martial attack i just want to go in the main line of the closed roy lopez and he plays d6 well the whole i shouldn't say the whole idea of c3 is to play d4 so when he takes the pawn you can capture back with a pawn it's also so that once he plays d6 if if white does nothing let's play king h1 which is not a move and black at plays here, we don't lose the bishop pair. We can tuck the bishop back here and gets what, what's called the Lopez bishops pointing toward the king side. Okay, so, <clears throat> so in this position, white would love to play d4. The problem is after d4, black can pin the knight and now he threatens to remove all the guards. He's going to remove the, the knight from guarding d4 but he's also going to, if the queen takes, that will remove the queen from guarding d4. So now if white, you know, plays h3, black will take the knight. And if white takes with the queen, black just wins this pawn. And white can't get a discovery on both knights because black will just take that pawn with the knight and the rook is guarded. So white's just losing this pawn. But if white takes back here... These squares around the king are very weak and the black queen's still on the board and the knight can come into these squares. This is very, this kind of Swiss cheesy kind of play on the king side is a little dangerous in this kind of position. So white can't, can't play after bishop g4. He, he, he has to do something about this pawn and, and the main move here is to play bishop e3. That blocks the rook from guarding this pawn but again, tactics, tactics, tactics. Knight takes e4 is a blunder due to bishop to d5 so that pawn is still safe all right well white can do this but this is a rare line what white ra would rather do would rather than doing this kind of stuff is play d4 where he doesn't have to worry about that so here we have back to the theme of our video which is now he can prevent the bishop pin the bishop pin is, is powerful because it threatens to remove two guards on the square and therefore the main move for white here is h3 and now we've reached the top of the opposition of the closed roy lopez black has many many moves he could play the classical line knight a5 the briar line knight b8 the zaitsev line bishop to b7 uh the smislav line i believe with h6 uh the karez line with knight d7 i think i got those names right so black has a variety of ways to play in the uh main line of the uh, closed Roy Lopez. So here, this is one of those cases where h3 is okay. And you know, you have to play it by ear. Every, every opening has its little idiosyncrasies. I know National Master Rich Pariso, one of the people who taught me, he was playing a game in the uh, center counter game. Pawn takes, queen takes, knight c3, queen a5, knight f3, knight f6 and he decided that both h3 and a3 would be okay in this kind of position h3 to prevent this pin from being a little annoying so he could put his bishop maybe on c4 and maybe a3 to keep the bishop out of here or maybe play b4 and drive the queen away so i think uh, i forget what his move order was but it might have been something like d4 c6 and now he played h3. Well, let's ask the computer, how is a3 or h3 in the top five here? And the computer says, well, I got a4 as number five, but I don't have h3 or a3 in the top five here. So this is kind of a little bit of a gray area. How much would white lose by playing a move like h3 here? Well, right now, the engine says white is up by 0.8 something, 0.87. If he plays h3, he still is better, but his lead has dropped to about 0.3. So it's definitely not the best move. It's not like white's losing now because he, he lost that tempo. So I may be 
playing a slightly wrong position where Rich played it. Maybe Rich played it even earlier, maybe he played a little later, but he thought maybe it would be reasonable to do that. But the point is there are these a lot of gray areas where maybe playing H3 or A3 as a, as a preventative move is perfectly reasonable. And there's other cases where it's just ridiculous. For instance, in this position, if white plays D4, it would be pretty ridiculous for black to play H6 to stop bishop G5. True as queen is on it, but so is the knight. I'd be very surprised if H6 is in the top five here. All right, Mr. Stockfish, you're going to make me a liar this time? Hopefully not. Okay, there we go. Yes, H6 is not in the top five here. It just wouldn't make any sense. It's a big waste of time. On the other hand, he does have A6 as the fourth best move over here, which does a little bit more, at least in the future. So, and now A6 is not in the top five anymore. So let's go, let's review the bottom line, which is sometimes you play H3 or A3 or H6 or A6 to prevent a pin. Usually you don't, but if he does pin you and the threat, the pin does not threaten to take the piece, then often you put the question to the bishop with that H3, A3, A6 once he does that. If you need a bishop on E3 or you're black and you need a bishop on E6, and the knight's going to come up and harass it and drive it away from its only really good square, then sure, maybe playing a move like h3 or f3 to stop the knight from coming down might make sense. If, if you can play h3, a3 kind of move and stop your opponent's like bishop from having its only good square on the board, and you can take it away and make it a bad piece, well then it might be worth a tempo to do that. But if you're just taking away a tempo from a piece that has another good square, let's say you play h6 here. And white laughs at you and says, all right, well, I wasn't necessarily going to put my bishop there anyway. I'm just going to develop my pieces here. And if you play bishop e7, I'll castle. And if you play bishop e7, I'll just put my bishop on a different square then. Well, you know, this, this move was kind of a big waste of time then. So you have to ask yourself, you know, am I really stopping something that's really, 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 really powerful? If it is then it might be worth it. But if you're just going, if you're just stopping him from making that move and he can make another move that's just as good or better, then it's a complete waste of time and you don't want to do it. All right, we could go on all day, but the best thing you can do is open a book, read a whole bunch of Grandmaster games, see when they do it, see when they don't, read what the author has to say, go over your games with your opponents, with an engine, and see when it's reasonable, see when it's not, and your brain slowly learns, oh yeah, this, this is a reasonable time, this is a not reasonable time that kind of thing, and you get better and better and better at it as you get better judgment. As I said, it's not a black and white issue. Sometimes there's complete gray where it's like, yeah, it's kind of reasonable, and yeah, you can get something out of it, but maybe you can do something a little better. You know, it's going to be that kind of thing. Okay, hope you enjoyed today's video. Please tell all your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess, and we will see you next time. Bye.